First of all, thank everyone for joining me. Can you see my shared screen? Yes? Yep. Okay. Yes. Great. All right. So before we start, I'd like to um, do an acknowledgement of country. So on behalf of those present, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on uh, which we now meet. Uh, I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of, a, of Australia and hope that the path towards reconciliation continues to be shared and embraced. So thank you everyone for joining me for the 2020 Assessors Briefing Session. We, we haven't done a briefing session in the past. I believe Angeline and Jin may have taken uh, past Assessors through Spark Plus and they still will be doing that. So this is session one. I think session two is scheduled for, is it next week, Angeline? Uh, yes, next Thursday, 2 to 3 p.m. So next Thursday. So you'll be going, so those of you that haven't, that are assessing for the first time, um, Angeline will take you through um, Spark Plus. So for today, I just wanted to cover, and I think we've got an hour. Is that right, Angeline? Just con just confirming that? We've got an hour this yes, morning? Yes, 11 to 12. 11 to 12. So yes. hopefully we won't take the full hour, but there's an you know, opportunity for questions. Um, so I want to just go give you an overview. Who are, the, who are the girls behind the scenes that do all the work? So I'd like to introduce them to you, the small team. So we're operating with a, a team of two. Um, if, if you remember when the awards were handled by uh, the Department of Education and Training, they had, you know, teams of, you know, 10 and 20. So, so we are really operating on a shoestring. Um, and the girls have done a fantastic job. So I'll introduce them to you in a moment. I want to cover the go through the key dates when things need to be done and what the process is so you're all clear of the process. Talk about your role and responsibility as an assessor. Um, we'll look, look at the assessment rate matrix and then just some tips on assessing just based on some of the assessments that I had done previously um, in other in other sort of settings as well. And then providing feedback and that's really important because we really want to give the um, recipients. Um, that are not successful ways that they can improve their application and also those that are successful acknowledging their good work. And then we'll have time for Q&A. So if we're all right to proceed, I'd first of all like to introduce the team. So you would hopefully, uh, Angeline and Jean have got their cameras on. Angeline, I just noticed you just turn your camera off now, but Angeline is there. Great photo of Angeline and Jean as well. Uh, these two girls have been working with me for the past... Has it been three years? I think it's been the past, including this year, has been three years, have been working with me to manage the, um, the awards. So all the comms that comes out, all the updates to the website, all the newsletters that come out, the reshaping of the Universities of Australia's website so that we've got a, a, a prominent position. If you go to their website, we've got a prominent prominent position on their website. These are the girls that make sure that that's all hand, handled. Behind the scenes, they're, they're developing the surveys, getting your feedback. They're all organising and planning the dates and the schedule when the awards are, are running, when the ceremonies will be held. So there's a lot, a lot of work that happens. So I'm actually quite amazed how much these two girls have, have done. So um, thanks, girls. So I want to go through... Um, a little bit, an overview, and I'm going to get Angeline to take you through this. Um, she's she's been recruiting, working with me to recruit the assessors. So, Angeline, you, would you like to take us through how many assessors we've got and the total number of nominations? I'll get you yep. to talk the slide. Yep, sure. And um, this year, based on the total number of submissions we received, so we have received a total of 170, which is a 7.6 percent drop from last year. Um, and based on that numbers, we have shortlisted 165 assessors out of 267 expressions of interest. So the assessors are mainly grouped in team of three, where we have one team leaders and two team members. So this year we have a total of 55 teams. Okay. 42 teams for citations, nine teams for teaching awards, and four teams for programs. And out of the um, 55 teams, majority of the teams were allocated, they are allocated with three nominations. There are five teams allocated with four nominations. So we are working on a smaller number of um, nominations, allocations, to emphasize on the quality of assessment we receive. 
Next slide, Angeline. Yep, let's get okay, so I'll, get, I'll yep. get Angeline to talk us through the process. So just on, um, yes. you're getting a smaller number of um, nominations to review. And I know how busy everyone is. So we, we, we really didn't want to overwhelm you. Having just gone through a process where I had to read 15 um, applications for for promotion for an educator track and each promotion was 25 pages plus another 25 pages of supporting evidence. It's, um, it's a lot of work. It's a, a real lot of work to do. Um, so we wanted to try and, you know, this is all done out of the goodness of your heart. You know, I, I know you're not getting time within your own workload to do this. So we wanted to try and keep the workload manageable. So we've really appreciated everyone that's put up their hand um, and we've given you like small teams to work with so it's easier to coordinate and less nominations to actually review. So thanks for doing that, Angeline. The next thing I want to cover, well, Angeline will cover for us, is the assessment dates, the key dates and the process. 2nd of October, that's, that's today. We're already in October. So you, you want to take us through these uh, key dates? Yeah, sure. So a quick run through of the uh, assessment process. Prior to the assessment, um, Assessors are required to either attend because we know that not everyone can make it or watch the uh, briefing sessions. So next Thursday, um, we have Mr. Mike Howard from Spark Plus to walk everyone through on how to use the online assessment system. And on the 12th of October, we, you will receive the assessors information packs from us and that include the assessors guidelines as well as uh, assessment instructions on how to use the system. Um, and in order for you to log into the system, you have to use the account ID. This year, we have introduced the account ID link that will be sent to you as well. So you click on the link, it will bring you to the login page and you just have to reset your password. On, also on the 12th of October, um, the awards portal is open for you to complete the online confidentiality agreement as well as conflicts of interest. So having received the account ID, you can just log in, reset the password and to complete the confidentiality agreement and conflicts of interest, and you get to see which awards type you are assessing. Would it be citations, program, or teaching awards? And in order to complete the conflicts of interest, you will get to view your allocated nominations. So look through the, uh, review the allocated nominations to see if there's any conflicts of interest, if there's no conflicts of interest, that's straightforward. If there is, please specify the reasons and it will come to the awards team, uh, awards team for us to review the reasoning behind it. And if there is a conflict of interest identified, uh, you may be excluded from assessing that nomination. Complete the confidentiality agreement and conflicts of interest. That is the prerequisite before you could actually assess any nominations. So that is open for a week. And on the 26th of October, during the assessment, um, so on the 26th of October, it is open for individual assessment. So use the same account ID and password to log in. So at this stage, you get to download the, nominate, the allocated nominations for you to review individually and go, go into the system to enter the rating and the feedback. Okay, so this is the individual assessment. And after the individual assessment on the 9th of November, the awards team will email you your team members. So this is where we encourage the team leaders to arrange collaborative meetings with the team members. So this year, we are only introducing the team after individual assessment. And on the 16th and 17th of November, you get to log in again with the account ID and password. But at this time, you are able to view what your team members have commanded. So these two days is for you to review and for you to prepare and get ready for the collaborative assessment. And on Wednesday, the 18th of November, the team get to come together. So during the period of time, 18 to 27 of November, the
the team members will come together to do the collaborative assessment on the final ratings and feedback. So this is where your team leaders will arrange um, the meeting, that's the, your meeting, a scheduled meeting date. And at the end of the collaborative assessment, your team leaders will review the final feedback and send the final feedback to all the team members so that you're on the same page of what is written in there. So this is the whole um, assessment process. And thereafter, the assessment feedback and ratings will be put forward to the awards committees for their confirmations. And the UA board was signed off in January. So you can see this whole process, um, is the assessment with where you guys are all included is gonna be a two month process basically. So the, the first part is the individual assessment. So you'll next week when you learn how to use Spark Plus, you'll go in and you'll see all the uh, nominations that are assigned to you. You go in and you will rate them. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then once you've completed that, you've got from the, the, the um, 26th of October to the 6th of November to, to do that. And then you'll have, um, you'll be the, the 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 team leader will introduce you to your other team members now we're not going to introduce you to your team members before you've done the individual assessment because we we want you to really do it on your own and not influenced by anyone at this stage so read the applications come up with your own individual assessment you'll then get introduced once that that's locked in you'll then get introduced to your to your team members and then um, you get an opportunity to review what other people, other individuals, um, how they've rated that, that um, nomination. You have two days to do that. Then you come together and you do a collaborative assessment. And it's during that collaborative assessment where you get to, I guess, influence your peers, you know, put your cases forward. If you feel like someone's been rated unfairly or rated too easily, that's when you have to come together and reach a consensus on the, the final assessment. So, Starting from today, the 2nd of October, there's a lot of pre-assessment stuff we've got to get through and then we'll go into the, the, the actual assessment towards the end of October to the end of November. And then, of course, we can only make recommendations. It has to go to the awards committee and then they, they will be the ones that confirm and then send it to the, the UA board. Okay, is everyone happy with that? I can't see any hands raised, so I think we're all right with that. Okay, now going to... Okay. All right, so just to tell you who's on the awards committee this year. So we've got three committees, an awards committee, a program awards committee, and a citations awards committee. So the chair of the teaching awards committee is Shelley Alexander. Uh, she's done that for the past two years. This will be her third year, and it'll be her final year. For each of the awards committee, what we also have set up is a deputy. So from next year, Pip Patterson, who's currently the deputy, will move on and she will be the chair. And we've got um, uh, members who we just, you know, check that they're comfortable to be on the committee each year and with approval from the chair um, and, and, and suggestions from the chair, um, we, we recruit the other, other members. Um, with the Program Awards Committee, we've got Kerry Lee Krauss as the chair. She's been the chair for the past two years. Uh, David Sadler has um, accepted to be the deputy chair. Again, this will be Kerry Lee's final year. Um, and then David Sadler will take the chair role from then on. And then we've got members across the higher ed and some independent consultants um, as members of the, the Program Awards Committee. And then finally, we have the Citations Award Committee, which is chaired by Denise Kirkpatrick. And we've got Philippa Levy as the deputy. Again, this will be um, Denise's last year. She's uh, chaired the awards for the previous two years and then this year. And then 2021, Philippa will be the chair and the members on that committee um, we recruit each year um, in accordance with who the, the, the chair would like to work with. So they're the three committees. So once you guys have done your individual assessments, you've, you've done your collaborative assessment, you've reached your consensus, 
we take all that feedback to these awards committee, the awards committee, and then they have the final say who will get the, who, who actually gets the, well, they don't have the final say. They then provide the recommendation, recommendations to the UA board and the UA board has the final say. All right, so moving to the role of assessors. So what's your role? Well, I, basically your role is to provide um, advice to the awards committee and for the awards committee to consider um, the advice that you've given them based on your thorough assessment of those, assessment of the nominations. Um, we also hope that we can uphold the standards, you know, um, a process like this, like I said, used to be managed in a government department, very fully funded, had lots of um, people working on it. Um, and we don't want the standards to drop because we are doing it on a, a sort of a, a much reduced scale. We still want to uphold the standards. So that's really important. And we also feel it's really important to acknowledge and, and promote excellence in, in learning and teaching. You know, one thing that this pandemic has really highlighted is, um, I guess, how important learning and teaching is. You know, that's the thing that funds the universities and it supports the research um, the research, yes, that helps us develop our reputation, but it's actually the, the funding that we get from our students that actually keeps the, the, the business running and, and helps support um, the research. Because we know when we get grants, those grants don't, doesn't cover the full cost of running that project. So that has to be subsidised and that's usually subsidised with money that's coming from our students. So it's really important, you know, there's lots of research awards, lots of opportunities to get um, scholarships for research. Um, we've seen the grants disappeared in the learning and teaching space. So it's really important we continue on with, um, with recognising our great teachers through these awards. And if the opportunity comes to really see if we can find funding sources to support innovations in learning and teaching as well. Though that, doesn't, that wouldn't be on the radar at the moment with the, um, the current government. And so we want to promote teaching and learning across high, the higher education sector and by you guys participating, hopefully you can feed um, your experience um, that, and what you've learned from this process back into your own institutions. Um, and we would like to sort of encourage systematic change. We're going to see, I guess, over the next couple of years, a lot of uh, interesting applications looking at how, the, how lectures have been reinvented um, how lab work has been virtualised or done remotely or through simulations. I imagine we're going to see a lot of those things coming through, if not, you know, in this round, but definitely I imagine in next year or the year after. And people will be spending lots of hours getting things done um, and they want to, you know, uh, it would be nice for them to be acknowledged. Uh, so expectations of assessors. So we want you to come prepared to the meeting. So, you know, we want you to read the applications once you've got them, go through the assessment matrix, make some, you know, decisions, be prepared to be committed to the process, set yourself some time aside. Um, as we said, hopefully we're, we're making the, we're not making this a huge workload. So hopefully you can, you can do this. Um, uh, we want you to provide your own individual um, assessment first before you come together as a team. Uh, your team leader will contact you before the collaborative assessment um, uh, pieces come. If you don't hear from a team member, uh, and I think uh, uh, Angeline set the dates just before, if you don't hear from the team member by the date, and I believe we'll be sharing these slides after this, so you'll have a copy of all the dates and things. Um, make sure that you contact your team leader um, or contact the, the girls from the team, Angeline or Jin, and we'll have an email at the end just to make sure, say, hey, I haven't been contacted. I've, I thought I was assigned to a team. Hopefully this should all work smoothly and it has worked smoothly in previous years, but you just never know. Um, so just make sure that you're keeping an eye out for that. Um, when, you, when we come together uh, as a collaborative team to, to um, uh, reach a consensus. It's really important that you listen to your other team members to hear what they've got to say and everyone has an opportunity to to present their views and to make sure that you're respectful with their comments um, and acknowledge um, the work and the time they've put into it. Even if you disagree, it's you would want to keep the conversations quite respectful and we want to make sure that we are providing a very fair and um, 
a quality assessment to each of the candidates as well. All right. Okay, roles and responsibilities of the team leader. So, Angeline, we, we don't know who the team, member, team leaders are at the moment, do we? Uh, we have not released the information yet, Ange. Right, but have we, um, but have we worked out who we want? Yes, yep. we have. We won't release yep. it afterwards. Um, so, the, the, those of you that will be team leaders are yet to find out. Your, what you'll need to do before the collaborative meeting is um, contact your team members and develop a, a plan, and that is a meeting plan, so when you want to meet so that everyone can meet together. Um, send through a calendar in, invite, whether it's through MS Teams or through Zoom, um, and plan the meeting quite early uh, in the piece. I think you've got uh, um, how many weeks? I think two weeks to do that collaborative piece. Is that right, Angeline? We said yes. Yes, yeah. yeah, two weeks. So plan that quite early so you can make sure that you can get everyone to come to that, that meeting and, and do that review. Uh, during the meeting, so uh, we're hoping that that will be facilitated via Zoom or MS Team. Work out with your team what, what's the best platform to use. Um, the, the, team, the team leader will actually sort of be the chair of that meeting, um, making sure that, you know, working to the right protocol, everyone's using positive language and being respectful. Um, go back to refer back to the assessment matrix, which we'll look at in a moment. Make sure you agree on the final ratings and um, collate all the feedback, you know, drafting the, the feedback and the comments, putting them in a sort of coherent manner that we can then... Um, that we can then use to send through to the, um, the awards committees. Um, and we want you to, once you're looking at the assessment matrix to perhaps, if it doesn't quite resonate or if there's things that you don't understand or if there's things that could be improved to collect that information and send it back through to us, because we'll revise that assessment matrix for the next iteration of the process, which will happen next year. Um, so there's a bit to do during the meeting, reach consensus, agree on a final rating, draft some feedback, and think about ways that you can improve the uh, assessment matrix. And then after the meeting, uh, go back and review all that collaborative feedback, uh, ensure your team members are happy with that, that they're all in agreement, and uh, email the, the team members, thanking them and just letting them know that this is what we had decided on. Angeline, have I missed anything there? Uh, no, and yep. all good. Yep. Great. And I, have, I can't see any hands up, so I think we are all okay. It's not, no hands are appearing on my screen. All right, now the assessment matrix. Um, so this year we've got um, four types of evidence. One, the first one, A, impact on student learning. Uh, student, in, student learning, student engagement, or the overall student experience for a period of no less than three years. So we want to award people who have shown sustained contribution and impact either on uh, student engagement, student experience, or student learning. Um, if we are looking at student learning, impact on student learning, then and they make claims that they are, then we really need to look at um, how they address students' misconceptions or how have marks been improved or where was an, an area that could be improved. So they really need to look at the marks and not rely on the student ratings. We see a lot of um, student evaluations being used and that student saying, yes, that you know, they like this, but did it really have an impact on their learning? So we need to you know, just make sure that they've got the right evidence for the right claims. Now, so there's... Um, Four, four pieces of, four pieces of um, four criteria, impact on student learning, student engagement, or overall student experience of a period of no less than three years, recognition gained from colleagues um, and the institution and or the broader community, shows criteria C, shows creativity, imagination, or innovation, and criteria D, Draw, draws on the scholarly literature on teaching and learning to inform the development of initiatives, programs and practices. So they're the four uh, criteria. And then we're going to assess them as not recommended. And that means the application is, doesn't demonstrate the things that it's claiming to demonstrate, or there's a lack of evidence, 
or it doesn't refer to any of the scholarly literature. So that's sort of the lowest end. Then there's, uh, it's sort of getting there, but it's pretty weak, needs further work. And I think from recall, we I don't think we've had many in those two categories because by the time the, the um, applicant works with the uh, ICO or their, their, their um, uh, promoting excellence team within the institution, they're usually at a, a pretty good, pretty good starting base. But we've got not recommended, lowest end, needs further work. And this is if the evidence is a bit weak um, or there's li limited evidence provided or um, they, haven't, they haven't sort of, um, they've, they've maybe just referenced some scholarly work but haven't really understood it or haven't applied it. That would be in sort of the, the needs further work. Then we've got the three that are commended, recommended and highly recommended. And it's usually the ones that in the highly recommended that will go forward, though I have seen the awards panel take some of the highly recommended and said, no, we don't believe that is, that needs to go down or we need, we believe this one should go up. So they have made changes um, even after the, the assessment teams have provided their recommendations. So with, with commended, there's um, student impact. There's some connections between um, uh, the, the initiative that the academic or the team has done um, and student learning or, or student experience. The claims are supported by different forms of evidence. That's not just student evaluations, but it might be other forms of evidence that could be used. So we want to make sure that that might be triangulated if possible. Um, and, you know, show some reflection in making, you know, uh, improvements through our sort of quality improvement process. Um, recognition gain from colleagues. So here we're looking at, has the initiative just been implemented in their own classroom and no one else knows about it? Has it been acknowledged by colleagues within their own school or department or faculty? Have they got recognition from the university where they've been invited in to give presentations across the whole university or have they had a broader impact across the Australian higher education sector? It might be within their state, it might be within Australia, it might even be internationally. Um, so commended is they've done, they've gone beyond just, you know, their innovation in their classroom. There's been some recognition out external from that. Then with creativity, um, we need to look at, you know, the thing that they're doing, is it, is it the thing that's new or is it the fact that it's been applied in a new context that's new? So we need to work out, you know, what is the thing that's creative or innovative um, or imaginative? And then again, who's done this before? How was it done before? What does the literature tell us about this type of practice? Uh, how has it been embedded? And, you know, what, what is the evidence to, to, to apply that? to our situation. Then we've got the recommended and the highly recommended. And there's the text in there that sort of will go through and, and describe, you know, what do we mean by recommended and highly recommended? So I'll, I'll leave the assessment matrix for you guys to go through and, um, and have, a, have a look and interpret that in your ways that you will interpret that when you're reading the applications. And more than happy to answer any questions on that going forward. I think maybe the next slide, which is the one where, when, when I'm assessing, when I'm looking at impact on student learning, what I've found is that um, through reading some applications that there's a real over-reliance on student rating. So we'll always get the student, you know, evaluations presented as evidence. And they try to present that as evidence as impact. So it's impact on, yes, it might, you know, the students might enjoy the experience so they can claim that towards the experience, but they can't really claim that towards student learning. So if we're looking at student learning, then we really need to see some sort of analysis of the assessments as the sort of the prime source of impact, you know, has have grades, you know, moved up or have there been less fa failures and what did they do to, to try and make that shift? And, and we want to see evidence collected systematically it shouldn't just be a once-off you know i have seen you know prior to students coming in we did this survey then i taught them and did this and then this is the results afterwards and we would have expected there to be an improvement before and after 
So that may not be the best sort of type of data to gather if we want to say that there, there has been sustained improvement over the years. And remember, we are expecting these applications not just to be a once-off thing, but, you know, to show that there's some improvement over the years and that they're really looking deeply at student learning and student engagement and what are the changes that they've made. Um, we've seen... Um, Applicants that use longitudinal data to explain how things have developed and connected that to an innovation. So that's quite helpful. I think that's a useful sort of um, data that uh, academics can, can use in their applications. Um, oh, and then if, if uh, now I know a lot of um, applications, you might say, oh, look, this is all to help develop the student's employability skills. And I guess what I would like to see when they're making claims of the employability skills is, how are those skills taught? Where do the students get to practice those skills? And how do we assess those skills? And how do we know that we're actually really making a difference? So there needs to be, I think, some evidence um, or systematic means in which we're capturing that, that information as well. Uh, then with the, the recognition, so the second criteria. So I think we need to think about the breadth of rec recognition. So who has recognised um, what you are doing? And are there testimonials provided? Have other people tried to apply it? How has it worked? Um, we may have seen uh, some, some evidence might be that academics or teams of academics are actually starting to build um, sustainable communities of practice. So they really focus on a particular area and it might be within their department or across the faculty. And, uh, and these communities of practice can really focus on some real important pedagogical ideas that they've highlighted in their application. Um, changes may also oh, another another way to um, evidence recognition is what changes have colleagues made um, over the time and how they evaluated that change and what's the extent and the nature of that change as well. So these are some tips around when you're looking at the first two criteria, and then with the second two criteria, the innovation and creativity. Um, I sort of mentioned this briefly before, but consider that the context, you know, is the, innovate, is the innovation the thing that's been developed or is it the innovation that it's been applied in a new context? Is that the creativity that they've taken something, they've implied it, applied it in a new context that hasn't been applied before? Um, what is the typical pedagogical practice in that particular discipline? Is this something out of the box? So if it's something out of the box, then yes, you could put it, you know, there'll be an argument there to, to talk about innovation and creativity and think about the impact of that innovation again on the student learning experience in their engagement and learning. And then finally, the final criteria around drawing on scholarly literature. Um, most applicants make reference to the scholarly literature um, and this is most often in the form of citations, but little engagement with the essence of the scholarly work. So we wanna make sure that they're really sort of engaged in that scholarly work. Um, some academics might even be producing their own um, publications based on the, what they've done. Um, so that's one way that they can, they can either draw on the scholarly literature or they actually are producing some scholarly literature themselves. Uh, some applicants may talk about their innovation because they got grants. Um, so they've secured internal or external grants. So that's also a good sort of indicator that they're, they're, um, they're drawing on presumably scholarly work, given that they've got a grant and that usually is based in a scholarly insights. Um, and if they have got a grant, then it's, and to support their work, then we want to make sure that they really explain uh, what they're doing, that it's connected to the educational literature and, and how, that, how that work has influenced um, the students' learning as well. So they're sort of the, the four criteria in the matrix. Uh, then we go into, and you'll go through this next week when you move into Spark Plus. So you'll be looking at those four criteria and you'll have to make a decision whether it's recommended, needs further work, commended, recommended or highly recommended. And this rating happens for each assessment criteria and then an overall. And sometimes you might rate things highly for each of the criteria, but then overall you think, oh, actually, I don't think it should be a, a highly recommended. I feel like overall it sits more in the recommended. Or you might rate all the individual criteria as 
commended and then you go, but this was really good actually overall. I think it needs to be, so you'll probably be going backwards and forwards between the criteria and the overall criteria. Angelina, I just noticed that we've got a, this year, in the previous years, um, when you did the assessment, you would rate a one, two, three, four, five. This year, there's no actual numbers that you'll be putting in, but you'll have these little arrows and you'll just slide the arrow across to where you think, or a slider, and you'll just slide it across to where you think uh, the application fits. Now, and- Oh, yeah, and there's just one arrow. So it's sort of like, it's, where, it's, it's like the sliding bar. So if you slice it, go to extreme right, is there indication of high, um, highly recommended and to, towards the left is the lower end of it. Yeah. There's only one. Yeah, so there's a sliding bar. Yep, just one sliding bar and you'll just slide that across to where you want your rating to sit. All right, so the, here, it, so this describes the different um, categories. So not recommended. Uh, the, the nomination is predominantly prescriptive in nature. Key evidence is not really there. It's missing a lot of the detail. No evidence is provided. Um, and I don't think we would have many in that category. And I don't know if we ever had any in that category previously, Angeline. Um, be good to, it would be good to actually, for the next briefing session next year, to actually let's collate how many we have in each of the categories so we can sort of get a sense of how that looks like. Because I imagine a lot of them would be in the commended, highly commended uh, commend, commended, highly commended and highly recommended. Um, needs further work. So um, the nomination lacks some depth in one or more of the criteria. The case is not strongly made. Uh, there's a lack of um, information. The evidence still might be weak. There's improvements that can be made in each of the areas. Commended now, the, the, the nomination demonstrates uh, the 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 nomination demonstrate that the work is comp competent. Most of the cr criteria met, in fact, all of the criteria met. Um, evidence are provided from some different sources, but the evidence could be a bit more compelling. Uh, recommended all the criteria and nomination components are met to a high standard. Um, very few issues with the criteria and nomination components. Um, the contribution is very clear, it's well evidenced, and there's multiple um, sources uh, of evidence provided. And then highly commended, all criteria are met to an exceptionally high standard. There's an outstanding contribution. We feel that that contribution is outstanding, strongly articulated, and the evidence is um, of a high quality and, and well evidenced throughout the whole application. And um, and it's supported by the, the scholarly literature as well. So they're sort of the different sort of categories. And as you start reading the applications and looking at the um, assessment rate, rate uh, assessment matrix, you'll be making your own judgments. And like I said, we're always looking to improve the assessment matrix. Um, and it's hard to sort of capture that in words because you'll you'll read something and you'll be toing and th throwing and but if you've got feedback for us, we're always happy to, to have a look at that, reflect on it and, and change that. And by the way, I should say that assessment matrix was based on input from a number of the Promoting Excellence um, members across Australia. So, you know, we got to that point with a lot of feedback. But as I said, always things can always improve. Okay, so that, the hard part is once you've done your individual assessment and then um, you have to write some feedback. And that's the hard part because you've got to really reflect on why did you make that decision? And you might want to pull out some of the, you know, comments in the assessment matrix, some of those phrases to, to help articulate your feedback. But really we want your feedback to reflect the rating. So if it's commended and it needs further work or why is it commended? So some positive things and we'll go through that in a moment and then some areas for improvement. So be very clear, be very specific and, and, and pull out bits that are unique to that nomination. Try and be constructive in your language. Um, so even if you draft something and it's all negative, 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 go back, reflect on it and say, okay, how can I convert this into a positive? Um, provide suggestions for improvement. So not only are you talking about what's well in this application, but how could it be improved going, going forward? I don't use the person's name, but use either the nominee or nomination. 
uh, and write in the third person, so the assessor. So um, that will be in your individual feedback. Now, with your individual feedback, that will then you'll use that to produce your collective team-based feedback, and it's the team-based feedback that we then send to the awards committee. So we won't be taking your individual feedback, but that will help hopefully inform your team-based meeting and it'll make that meeting work, run and work more, more effectively and efficiently. Um, so the written feedback. So you'll have to provide some individual feedback and then we have to provide some collaborative feedback. And we'd like you to provide between three to five um, points in terms of what are the strengths of the application and what are the areas for improvement? So really talk about, you know, what really stands out in this application? You know, is it well written or is the innovation, you know, something that's very exciting or it's well recognised with their colleagues or it's, it's um, really applied the research literature, it's put that into practice or there's the way they've gathered their data or analysed the data. So what are the strengths of that application? And then what are the areas for improvement? And we want you to do that for each of the criteria and then the overall section. So, you know, there's the first criteria we're talking about student experience or student learning. Um, what are the strengths in that space? And then what are the areas for improvement in that space? And five might be hard to do, but I think most people could probably write three. And hopefully um, the things that you write will overlap. So when you come together as a group, you've got um, things that you can share. All right, examples of quality feedback. Well, you know, these are some examples. I'll actually hopefully pull some out through the next uh, round. But, you, you know, here are some, uh, say Dr. X, if it's an individual nomination, Dr. X teaching is guided by a very clear philosophy derived by Vygotsky's zone of proximal development theory. Um, Liam, you might, you might be smiling because it's yeah, <laughs> something that we've used. Uh, the appropriateness uh, and applications of this theory are evident in a deliberate way. He has redesigned his teaching to scaffold students through greater autonomy, self-regulation and confidence. So there's some of the things that you might want to say is a strength of the application, uh, areas to improve while Dr. X is clearly very thoughtful about his teaching and is it tuned to industry and student needs. He is not yet making systematic use of student achievement information, so student results, to assess the impact of the design changes he has instituted. So these are very general, generic things just for the purpose of this, but it gives you a sense that, you know, they're doing something good, but, you know, you could do other things a little bit better. Um, limited references made to scholarly work uh, in learning and teaching, because um, you might be explaining their teaching philosophy. Um, uh, so these are just some of, the, some of the examples of written feedback. All right, I think this is bringing us to the end. So, Angeline, what would you like um, the assessors, the final reminders, complete their confidentiality agreement, uh, any conflict of interest, um, and contact IT to release an email for, for Spark Plus? Yeah, that's because in the past, we um, understand that some assessors are having issues in receiving resetting passwords, emails from Spark Plus. So to avoid um, the problem is actually get ahead of it, contact your IT to let them know that release emails from these two emails from Spark Plus so that it will not just be hold on to the internal systems. And uh, lastly is... Um, optional for awards team to join your Zoom meeting. We're happy to be there in the first five minutes just to answer any questions that you may have. But if you feel that you have done it before, you have confidence, you don't need us to be there, uh, it's just to let you know that we're available. Yep. Great. I think that's the last slides. First of all, uh, questions from the Catherine and the Sam. They are asking, is there any weighting to the criteria? such as if two criteria are high recommended and then two are recommended, what do we as average as? You would average it somewhere in between. So if two criteria are highly recommended. So, so the criteria, I guess, are equally weighted. But if you feel like there should be some that are more weighted than the others, like you might feel that the, the student learning should be weighted more than the other, then let us know. But at the moment, they're sort of equally weighted. So yes, and, and look, you'll have that discussion with your teams and then this is where we really like the feedback. 
coming to us after you've done the assessment and you've worked through that with your teams. Um, Angela, just to add on to what Angela has said is that in when you're doing the assessment, you actually give rating for each of the criteria and there is that overall rating um, yeah. sliding bar as well. So it's taken from all of them. Yeah. And uh, also the next question is regarding um, what does the awards committee look at in deciding who gets the awards? Is there a cutoff ranking? Um, we do have, um, Angeline, you'll, you'll know that the, um, the number of awards that are issued, there is an upper limit. Uh, yes, we, we usually give the whole, uh, the, all the results and highlighting the highly recommended, meaning the top 20% to the awards committees. But what, like what Angela has mentioned is that there have been occasions where the awards committee look at their recommended. So I would say the top uh, 20 to 30%. And so as you know that the awards committees are provided with the actual PDF submission as well. So there are occasions where they will actually look into the actual submissions um, to make the decisions. So we provide them with the, of the, the numbers, so the ranking of all the overall. Yep, from, from the highest to the lowest, oh. and then they'll be provided with the uh, top 20% PDF submissions and any other submissions that they ask for. And they, they yeah. might look at some of the highly recommended and they'll say, no, we don't believe this is highly recommended, and they might move it down and they might move something else up. So they have the final, they have the final say. But what do they look at? They look at your overall comments. They look at your comments, so it's really important what you write there. And then they have to they have to decide whether those comments resonate with them once they've read the application. Um, and they look at the ratings as well. And then they will be comparing across, because remember these are different groups, whereas the awards committee will be comparing across all the different groups. Yeah, so each group will be putting, you know, their, they'll be the rating their three or four, um, but the awards committee will be seeing cutting across all of them. So when someone in one team rates something really high, is that consistent with another team's high rating? So they will look at those sorts of things. Yeah. So they've got a tough job ahead of them. And there is a question uh, regarding the um, last criteria on the uh, marking uh, matrix. There is a mention of a teaching philosophy under scholarly literature criterion. Does the teaching philosophy necessary have to be specific, which in most cases it is, is not? Yeah, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Um, sometimes academics like to write about their, talk about their teaching philosophy first before they talk about student learning and their innovation because it's really tied in with their philosophy. Um, and they've usually ground that, but it's, it's not a requirement in this, in these applications. And uh, one more question. How many teams rate each application? How many teams rate each application? So uh, one team, which is made up of three or four, I think we've made them up of three this time round. Yep. So each application that that team will receive will rate. So each application will have three individual assessments and then an overall assessment. And then it'll go to the awards committee and the awards committee will look at those assessment across all the other teams. So the awards, awards committee look across the teams. And that's all the questions I collected so far from the uh, chat box. Right. Um, and I saw another question, just to add on to what Jean has said. Uh, Mary, you have a question on the guidelines on conflicts of interest. Uh, just to let you know that there's some information included in the assessor's guidelines. And the way we allocate is we aim to allocate the assessors from different institutions and different states. So that will minimize um, any conflicts of interest. Um, Two more questions from uh, the hands up, Phil, from yes. Judith. Um, I just wanted to share an experience with, with um, organizing the collaborative meeting. As a team leader, I didn't realize that my team were in different states. 
and gave them the Victorian time frame and it wasted a lot of time. So I just wanted to put that up front. So if you're a team leader, make sure you take that into account. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Angeline, is there any way when we um, contact the team leader and let them know who their team members are, can we tell them what state? Actually, we, uh, just, we can tell them what university they're from and they can work out the state. Uh, yes, Angie, we, we have the information in there. So we will have the name, the institutions, states and emails in the email when we send out. Yeah. Thank you for that. Who was that that spoke? Because I couldn't tell from the... Um, it was me, Judith Lyons. You, Judith. Yeah, thank you, Judith. And I think Phil's got his hand up as well. Phil, did you... Hi, Angela. Thank you. Um, just the, actually, it's another one about the team. Um, I was the team leader last year too. And one of my team members was fortunate to be on study leave and was in France. So the logistics of arranging the meeting was um, uh, challenging. So I did make the comment, I understand why you don't want to let people know the team members too early, but Spark can be constructed so that we can put our own individual submissions in and we won't see anyone else's until the um, Spark Plus administrator releases them. So you could let people know their team members without them ever seeing the uh, individual team members' assessments until Spark Plus allows that. Yes. So, yeah, I guess it was more about if we let them know, you know, could they have conversations outside of Spark Plus um, and yeah. unlikely to happen and we'd ask them not to happen, but we just thought, look, just for, um, you know, a following yeah. process. We needed a few weeks to, or two or three weeks to get different times where we could meet given the time difference. That's all. I guess uh, we well, not people overseas this year. this year. I think this year not many people will be overseas, so that's, that's right. a problem for yeah. this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, sure. also, Phil, just to add on to what Angela has said, is that very earlier on, we have released the date to all the um, assessors, saying that this is a period of time for collaborative assessment. So as by right, we will be um, expecting the assessors to set those time, that period of time sure. for collaborative okay. assessment. All right, thanks. Okay, it's 12 o'clock, Angela. Okay, all right. So I just want to, if there's no further questions, um, We'll finish up now, but if there are, please email the team and then they can forward the questions on to me. I hope you found this um, useful. Um, it's always good to, to put everyone on the same page. Um, as I said, any questions, email the team. I just would like to thank you all for giving up your precious time. I know that you're just doing this out of the goodness of your heart and without people like you, we just wouldn't be able to continue with this process. So we're still, we're still you know, continuing with it. We're hoping that we can get um, funding. We know we've got the funding for next year at this point in time, but you know who knows with the you know situation um, that we're that Australia's in. Um, who knows what what changes might change? But it looks like Australia, Australia's in a good position. There might be some opening of the borders next year, which will allow our international students coming back, returning to Australia. Australia is one of the best places to get an education in. We've got some of the best. Um, the higher education institutions in this country. So it's a, it's a really sort of um, great place from students' eyes to, to come to, to return to, um, and even attract newer students. But it's just about managing the, the virus, opening up the borders and making sure that, you know, our quarantine procedures are really up to scratch. So I do think some really innovative stuff is going to come out in the next couple of years, given we're going through COVID. And I really hope that we can acknowledge the people that are putting in all the effort to, to make teaching and learning in Australia uh, one of the best places to come and get an education. So thank you very much. I really appreciate all your time. And thank you for allowing us to take a photo. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you might see your face up on Twitter with one of our group little shots. So thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Angeline, and thank you, Jean.